Hello, welcome back. This is local Tico Grohe. Today we are doing a warrior run. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than last time. Uh, starting with our gear, we have both physical weapons and then a Dwells of Light for Holy and Twinterfang for magic and bludgeoning damage. That's for living armor specifically. We have the entire immortal set. Each piece gives us a little health restoration. They do stack. That is going to be how we survive the run. We will not be using curatives or healing in any other way other than the immortal set. Um, we will not also be standing around waiting for our health to restore. We will instead uh, press on rings. We have the barbed nails for stagger and knockdown, and then we have upgrades to indomitable Indom lash and uh, arc of deliverance. Then the Ring of Desiccation to prevent Drenched status. Uh, well, we leveled up 10 Warriors of Fighter and 190 levels of Warrior. Um, and then for our Augments, we have the standard Autonomy Impact Clout, but then we also have Acuity for magic damage to help with those enemies. Bastion for increased regular defenses, and then Audacity to protect us from getting knocked over while using focused attacks. As I said, this run's a little bit different. This is going to be a run where we use only abilities. Well, the only abilities we can use are of the focused attacks themselves. So, Lash, Arc of, and then Act of Vengeance. We don't really use them a whole lot because they're honestly not very effective often. But the rest of our attacks are going to be normal attacks. This run was notably harder than my other warrior run that we've done because uh, we can't use Exodus Slash to avoid damage. I also tried to make it so that I didn't do as many uh, jumping light attacks as normal. Because normally you want to use the jumping light attack a lot because it has uh, good recovery. Basically when you do a jumping light attack, the moment you hit the ground, you can do another action, whereas, which makes it faster than if you're standing on the ground and then you use a regular light attack, because you can't do another light attack until that entire animation is completed. Um, so this uh, runs a little bit slow. For that, it is quite long, in fact. Uh, this is one of the longer runs we've put up. If not the longest run we've put up, I don't actually know. I would have to look. But it's quite long. Um, very slow. As I said, we have Indominal Lash, Arc of Deliverance, and Act of Vengeance. We do not constantly use these abilities. The reason for this is they are difficult to execute consistently. Uh, enemies move around. Goblins, for example, move around too fast. So we just don't get the hits off. Archive is the move we probably use the most. And it's because we can set it up. There we go. Put the thing on for Arc of Obliteration. Arc of Obliteration, probably one of, if not the most satisfying <laughs> weapon skill in the entire game. Um, unfortunately, it takes like, I don't know, 10 seconds to charge. And then once you have it charged, you can absolutely slap something. Um, the fact that it takes so long to charge is what makes it not very effective, though. It does good damage, don't get me wrong, but in my experience, it doesn't do the kind of damage that there were jumping that would specifically hit the Um Anyway, Arc of Obliteration never really seems to do the kind of damage that I would expect of a 10 second cast. <laughs> Not when our regular attacks do as much damage as they do. Like, we did about, I want to say it was like close to three health bars on the first one. We did like a health bar and a half with just those like three or four jumping light attacks afterwards. So like, why would I ever choose to use Arc of Obliteration? Eh, because it consistently knocks everything over. Um, it does have a CC component. 
But that's my point, though. It's, uh, it's not the most effective ability. Here we're doing jumping heavies. Um, it's because they hit so many times. And they hit vertical, so, like, we don't, we don't miss things with um, you saw earlier I was tra channeling the Arc of Obliteration and we got knocked out of it with a uh, Goblin. That's another thing that I don't like about any of these moves is that it's really easy to knock you out. The reason I basically never use Active Vengeance is because you just take too much damage for the damage that you end up doing. It's just not worth it in my opinion. If It's great if you're using curatives, of course, but if you're not using curatives, it's just like, kind of a waste in my opinion. So we did a bit more than a health bar with that Arc of Obliteration, and then we did another health bar with just swinging the hammer there in literally half the time that it took to charge it. But anyway, um, we have the Audacity Augment to prevent us from getting staggered when we're mounting a focus attack that includes Arc of Obliteration. Uh, you still get knocked out of things pretty consistently. Um, Active Vengeance is kind of the worst move because... It... Requires you to get hit in order to be able to do any decent damage and then In requiring you to get hit You'll often get staggered out of it even with the audacity augment. I genuinely don't know How people play with it there's like very specific like abilities you can tank with it from what I can tell that makes it very valuable But without having curative either magic or curatives themselves, it just becomes an ability that we don't get value out of. So this run, I don't think I ever use it on this run, we just happen to have it on the bar. Arc of Obliteration, like I said, is the one we use the most because it has some better use cases. Garm, Chimera. Lash isn't bad either, it does have some use cases. The biggest problem Lash has is the fact that you're stationary for it, and very rarely are enemies stationary for you. Arc of Obliteration, you can move around. Indominal Lash, it's much faster, but you don't get to go anywhere. So we basically have to have something knocked over to use Lash, which is fine, but again. It's, it's more or less a requirement for Lash to be effective. So it, it just requires more setup. What's nice about Warrior is that's kind of their whole bit. If you are getting into playing Warrior, um, the way I would recommend learning Warrior or Fighter is focus on hitting things in like their faces, their critical spots, and going for knockdowns on them. He should fall into the water, yeah. Go for knockdowns. Once things are knocked down is when you do damage, really, as a warrior. Um, which is why Arc of becomes valuable. I, I kind of touched on that earlier. The CC, the crowd control effect of knocking things down, is very valuable for warrior. Because once things are on the ground, you can now hit them safely. But you also hit them really great damage because warriors just regular attacks deal so so much the core skills are just fantastic damage and when things are knocked down you really get to see the value of that because when things are knocked down you do additional damage to them and Arc of Obliteration sets that up pretty nicely if, big if, but if you can get the hits in the way you want. And that's, that's really the crux of the issue, right? Because getting those hits in is, that's the trick. But with that, we've got the Garden of Ignominy completed. This is one of our more decked out runs as far as gear and armor goes. It's because I knew we would take a lot of damage this run uh, and we would need 
recovery from health as well as good defenses to survive it. That's why we're wearing the Immortal set. The Immortal set is the tier two bitter black armor, or it's the bitter black armor level two armor set for red vocations. Duskmoon Tower, we've got the Wyvern configuration, which is the easier one. Um, not to say that we can't deal with the, the Hellhounds and the Fire Drake, but the Wyvern's just significantly easier. I will say that I find fighting the Wyvern itself more annoying uh, on the whole, however, because of the flight that it is so keen to engage in. Uh, we have to knock it out of the sky to be able to do anything. And uh, it's, it doesn't give us good opportunities often. And especially when I miss the tail for the first two swings. What is nice is once we knock it to the ground, we do deal truly uh, good damage. There, we're doing jump attacks. We can't really reach him otherwise. We need to get that vertical swing in. Uh, same thing with the tail. The tail we could reach, the big problem with that is we just don't attack fast enough to build up enough stagger for it. There I got hit by the breath. The uh, breath did damage to me, but it didn't stagger me because we have good stagger resistance. But to avoid the breath, you actually need to kind of run to his tail, not head on like that. You want to kind of run in like a curve. So go around to the right, around the breath. Yes, you can make it, but it's not as as I'd like it to be. And that's true for all, for all dragons that are flying. If you're trying to close the distance, because they'll, if they're focusing on you, they'll kind of maintain a specific distance. I don't know why I'm just running in here and gambling with it. I generally don't do that, but I'm surprised we didn't opt to use Lash here. But it's probably because we tested Lash out, and it's not that much better damage-wise than just these jumping heavies. There, those jumping lights were an attempt to hit the heart while he was standing. We failed, obviously. But the jumping heavies are so that we can place multiple hits on the heart. If we don't do a jumping heavy, we don't really have another attack that we can use that's going to hit the heart in the same way. By the same way, I mean, like, consistently. <laughs> So, we could just stand there and use light attacks, or even the heavy attack, and it would do all right. But we would just hit significantly less, and this is already going to be two videos that total close to four hours. So, we don't really need it. I guess it's closer to like three and a half, maybe, than four. It's still quite some time. And there's the Wyvern. Now it's the Ward of Regret. So the Ward of Regret can have two configurations. One of them is Ghosts, so I might be switching to the Dwells in Light here. If it's not Ghosts, we'll have Skeletons, at which point I'll switch to the uh, Hammer, which is called something else. I'm can't remember what it's called at the moment. Devil's Nail? Something like that? Looks like it's Devil's Nail time. But I can't hear the ghost. Skeleton's weak to bludgeoning. That's why we have this. Earlier I talked about the weapons that we have. 
Golden Light is specifically for... And this is a big limitation of not having Exit Slash. We can't iframe those swings, so we just take them. <laughs> we just get hit. Uh, there's very little we can do to evade enemies. We have to, like, physically move our body out of the way. Which works sometimes, but not as consistently as one might hope. But yeah, um... Earlier I talked about Twinterfang and Dwells in Light. Dwells in Light is specifically for when we are fighting ghosts. We also use it on, I want to say, Poisoned Undead. So we'll use it right now. We also use it on these spiders. But it's because spiders are very susceptible to the elements. So if you hit it with an element, it'll always proc its elemental effect. Which for... Uh, Spider, er, which for Holy is healing. The healing you receive, for those who do not know, is a calculation of 10% of your base magic defense. Not your complete magic defense with your augments and your armor and stuff. The base one you get from leveling. Ours is probably about 165, 66. I don't remember what it is if you level up exclusively as fighter and warrior. Um, but it's not very high. So we're probably getting back, like, 17 health every time. Here I'm probably replying to chat. We do stream these runs live over at twitch.tv slash local Tico Brohe. This, uh, this one was hard, actually. It took us quite some time to get this run without dying. It was, it's very easy to die in this run. Sometimes I'll use Arc of Obliteration on these guys because it'll usually one-shot them with the hammer. I guess I'm debating that, slash talking to chat. Uh, but yeah, so we'll use Dwells in Light, like I said, when relevant. The Twinterfang, we have specifically for living armor. Uh, the reason we use the Twinterfang is because living armor in Phase 2 after their armor is broken. Living armor is weak to... Uh, magic damage, or rather, it's only vulnerable to magic damage. It is not susceptible to physical at all. Um, but it's vulnerable to magic damage, and then it's vulnerable to... bludgeoning. So, if we have Dwells in Light... We'll actually do less damage than if we have a Twinterfang. So, we use the Twinterfang to make sure that we get both the bludgeoning damage and the damage of um, Frost magic specifically. We don't really need a specific element to be able to kill the living armor, it's just some magic damage in general. So. Twinterfang suffices. Should really stop doing that. Um, as you see, we've missed that one. The, the last time we attacked him while he was still down, or she was still down, we barely did damage. So I should really stop trying to Arco while it's not landing up here on the platform with me. If it makes it onto the platform with me, go ahead. But when it can't make it onto the platform, it just kind of waste our damage. I think here I was trying to see if it would make it up to the platform. I'm also waiting on stamina. As you see with our 
avoiding damage, we haven't, uh, we've managed to recover all of our health with the attacks that we have. And it's, uh, quite noticeable. The amount of regeneration we get, I mean. I fell for it again. Uh, you hate to see it at the stage of his career, folks. I don't know why our Elder Ogre friend here has failed to figure out. Okay, that was like way late. I should have tried to do it as its jump was about to come out. That way we could get it while it's in the air. Hey, it made it up. And it's down. That was decent, I guess. Jumping light attacks are so that we hit the face. If you hit the face with Elder Ogres, you actually knock them down very consistently with high stagger. Um, I don't usually go for this strategy where we stay up here and use Arc of, but it's also not something that's typically available to us, so I think I wanted to see if it was going to be effective. I would say not very. I mean, we didn't get hit at all this fight. Or at least not yet. There's time. <laughs> There's time. Uh, but we haven't been hit at all, but it's been very slow. And we've missed, like, what is that, the fourth or fifth arc of obliteration? It's a large move to spend so much time attempting and then not succeeding on. So, I don't know. Okay, that time it changed its behavior on my swing. I was timing it to when it jumps, and instead of jumping, it turns to face me, so I just <laughs> whipped. Unreal. Unreal. It's just trolling me at this stage. Can you blame it, though? There we go. Now, to the left, we're going to have Poisoned Undead. Generally, if things don't spawn until we get close to them, I usually won't actually kill them on our runs. But... It looks like we're going to go deal with these guys. We're hoping for some stamina here. That being said, all of our abilities are largely ineffective against them, so we don't really need stamina to fight these guys. We don't have moves that we're going to use stamina on. Because swinging regularly doesn't consume stamina. And we're not going to use Arc of Obliteration or Lash. Just because they don't, they don't deal enough damage to these guys. It's really just our sword swings. Which, as you see, aren't terrible. For how... Uh, good... The defenses are for... Poisoned Undead. We are quite happy with this amount of damage. There are actually three Poisoned Undead. I think the third one's spawning right behind us now. Yeah, there it is. 
Now there, I should have been using the other combination. This one. Oh, well, I canceled it, but... I should have been using the other combination where you spin. It hits... Uh, both of them better. I think we had two enemies that were kind of clustered. We didn't really need... them to be so... We didn't need to use that combination, which has that vertical attack at the end. But, you know, whatever. We'll take what we can. We're dealing good damage. We're not losing health. We're almost two out of three. Unfortunately, we still have more to go after these two. We did step into the poison there. That's one of those things that's more or less inevitable to kill these guys. You're going to likely step into the poison. Just because they coat so much area. Uh, in this case, we only stepped in it a little bit, and so we've managed to recover that health already. But it is still a little bit rough. I don't know how the poison counts its damage. I, don't, I would assume it counts as, like, magic damage. Instead of physical. The reason I bring that up is because, uh... We do have the Bastion Augment, which... Greatly reduces the physical damage we receive. But I don't actually know, as I said. Poison might be in its own camp of damage, for all I know. It doesn't ultimately matter to me. Now we're going to have two giant skeletons again, so we're going to whip out the hammer, and then we'll have... I think two poisons undead as well. One's already standing, but one will spawn as we get close. Often the skeletal guys will come out here, which is why I'm kind of just standing here. There we go. I'm going to say usually we can get them to come out and we can just fight them. The second one often will get caught on this chest, so... That was not unusual to see. Alright, back to Dwells in Light. Dwells in Light, for those who do not know, Dwells in Light is the only holy longsword. You obtain it by killing the Ur Dragon, but you can only kill it by obtain or you can only obtain it by killing the online version of the Ur Dragon. The offline can only drop the straight sword, the Daggers and the Volant White Mage Staff. Sorry, the Mage Staff. So the Ascalon Heaven's Keys. Heaven's Key, rather. I always put plural on keys because it's two daggers, but it's Heaven's Key. And then uh, the Volant White Staff. If you want Dwells in Light, or Angel's Fist for that matter, which is the hammer, you have to kill the online version. Which is a bit of a bummer, I will admit. Uh, we farmed this one out before making the character, actually. Uh, what we did is we... We were on a Strider, I think on our character beforehand, or Assassin, actually. I believe we were an Assassin. But anyway, uh, what we did is we just did the strategy where you use the Maker's Finger to remove hearts, which is expensive, but we actually completely solo killed an entire online dragon in only like an hour and change. Wasn't too bad. Very expensive though. I want to say it's like... I'm probably wrong, actually. I want to say it's like 300,000 gold every Maker's Finger arrow. 
you can only use one at a time. So you basically go to Fornival, buy a Maker's Finger, go to the Ur Dragon, use the Maker's Finger on one heart, destroy the heart, fairy stone out, or and then uh, actually no, what you don't fairy stone out. What you do is you load checkpoint save because it'll automatically sync the online Ur Dragon for you. There we heard a roar. We have the dragon. Frostworm is what it is. Frostworms are not that bad for us because we do deal good damage. I'm hitting the wings because I don't want to be frozen. I'm jumping to do so because our horizontal slashes often just miss, <laughs> frankly. Our goal is to knock it over. Hitting the wings will also build up stagger, so we can knock it over with that somewhat consistently, in fact. Uh, but once we knock it over, we're going to use typically either jumping heavies or like the lashes. Kind of depends on how spicy I'm feeling. Um, but once we knock it over, we're just going to wail on the heart. We actually build decent damage to these guys once we knock it over. Obviously, we do okay damage to their hearts. There we go, that's a knockdown. Jumping heavy. That one jumping heavy attack does slightly more than a health bar while it's knocked over. So you see, we do quite good. We are not disappointed in the amount of damage we deal. Wow. This should be the kill right here. Assuming some weird shenanigans. That was a pretty smooth kill. We end with full health. Not bad. Next, however, we're going to have a handful of Strigoi. The Strigoi spawn at specific periods, specific points, as we ascend this room. So you'll see the first one will start to spawn once I get to the top of these stairs and down the hall a little bit, or the side rail there. You can hear it. Yeah, I'm probably pulling out the hammer. I think these guys are weak to bludgeoning. I don't actually know. They're pretty resilient in general, so I don't actually know. Um, but I'm pretty sure that they're weaker to bludgeoning than they are to slash. But feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And that's a cursed dragon spawn. So I don't want to be fighting both at the same time, so we're going to focus on this. Strigoi. Fortunately, the other three Strigoi that are in the room will not spawn until we keep climbing. So we're actually pretty safe to fight this uh, Cursed Dragon one-on-one. -on -one. We should be switching back to the sword now, bitter end. While the Cursed Dragon may be weak to holy damage, uh, ultimately we don't have enough magic damage to make the holy aspect of that sword particularly valuable. Um, and so we don't. <laughs> but we have so much physical strength that, you know, with our 4,000 strength with the bitter end equipped, we can just thwack this guy with physical damage. Succeed. At some point I would like to do like a run where I level as sorcerer the whole day and then play as warrior and see how much damage we can get out of our magic weapons. Because the stats on them aren't the worst thing, they're not terrible.
There's our first indomitable lash of the entire run. I don't remember if we switched to the savage lash ring. It doesn't look like it. You saw it actually does decent damage. But you have to be fighting something that is stationary. And that's the trick. Another uh, trick that you can do is you can use Arc of Obliteration when you knock it down the first time. And when it stands up, you can finish and drop the Arc of Obliteration on it and it'll generally knock it down again. So you can just chain CC the Cursed Dragon. Uh, however, its damage isn't the most incredible thing. You never will get the hit while it's on the ground. It just takes too long. And you run out of stamina. But if you want to use like some stamina curatives or something like that, it's pretty fun. We actually did that when we uh, were going through Bitter Black Isle on our first run on this guy. It was right after we had finished Grancis. We were probably around like level 60 or so. We weren't that strong, so when we ran into our first fish dragon, that was pretty much the only strategy we could <laughs> use to kill it. Arc of Obliteration is dead. Consistently pop it. Let's see if I get poisoned. Oh no, no, we're good. Again, light attacks, the jumping light attacks aren't because I want the more damage or faster damage, it's because it's the it's so that I can aim at that part more effectively. You're standing like horizontal swings are goofy enough that it becomes awkward strong to actually land hits the way you want them to. Um, if you are an aspiring warrior, I wouldn't really recommend the setup I'm using to begin. Uh, but if you are an aspiring warrior, what I would say is the jumping light attack is actually extremely powerful. It's kind of your bread and butter tool, unfortunately, because it feels a little bit silly. But uh, it's, it's very, very strong, and it works quite nicely with the eminence augment that you get from Strider. We do not have that augment because I didn't want my jumping light attacks to be what carries our run. Um, it is a useful tool and it serves a very good purpose on the fights that we use it. But I wanted to fight more things not that way. That's why you saw us fight things in the first room with our feet playing. Even if we're just using basic attacks. We did it with our feet planted so that we can move away from the jumping light attack. But of course, because the jumping light attack does swing vertically, it becomes extremely valuable when fighting many different creatures. So we still make fairly extensive use of it. But because of that, more or less, necessity I didn't want it to be extra strong, so I took the Eminence Augment off. Well, I didn't have it on in the first place, but I didn't want to put it on. Yeah, see, we jump in light attack and knock him down, and then once we knock him down, horizontals, planted feet. I will say, however, uh, going back to the Eminence Augment, the jumping heavy attack, the Eminence Augment kind of basically the way it appears to work is it tracks whether your feet are on the ground or not. If the answer is false, they are not on the ground. Then it deals increased damage. If the answer is true, your feet are on the ground, it doesn't. So when we do the jumping heavy attack, your damage doesn't come out until your feet hit the ground again. So, you never get the Eminence Augment buff. You're going to do the same amount of damage with or without the Eminence Augment on the Jumping Heavies. 
So if you're thinking, I have the Eminence augment, I should do jumping heavy attacks to really juice some of these hits. Uh, it will not work that way. It's exclusively on the jumping light attack for Warrior. Enemy. Obviously, Eminence is a Strider augment. It wasn't designed for the Warrior specifically. So it's kind of irrelevant, but if you are struggling with Warrior and you're finding out the dark tech of the jumping light attack, <laughs> you can buff it. I mean, that's my little PSA. These guys spawned again. Uh, so when enemies spawn in these rooms, I'm always a little bit annoyed because these runs are generally long enough as it is. At this stage, we're about 40 minutes into a video. And we've completed four rooms total. Five rooms? No, four rooms. And we're fighting the third one a second time because enemies respawn. That's not what I want. Uh, but generally, they respawn because we spent too much time. 40 minutes, I said. 40 minutes is about the day-night cycle. Uh, so it has become the next day. Uh, because of that, certain enemies will spawn, but not all of them, generally. Usually the lesser enemies of a room will respawn, and the greater enemies of the room will not. So our skeletal knights maybe won't spawn again, the gold and silver knights. I don't recall. And even then, they might not be that overwhelming to have them not spawn. But obviously the two skeletal warriors that were in this room didn't even spawn either, so... It's a question mark as to whether, you know, what things will spawn and what things won't. But going back out to Duskmoon Tower after this, we will likely have... We will likely have, uh... A gargoyle or two, but we certainly will not have a dragon because things will take longer to respawn. It has not been 40 minutes since we killed these guys. It's been probably closer to like 10 or 15. But we can look at the chapters to clarify that. I'm not going to bother. <laughs> because it's irrelevant. Uh, the point is it hasn't been a full day-night cycle since I killed these guys, but the day has probably just rolled over. And that's what triggers these guys to respawn. It doesn't have to do entirely with whether it's been like 24 hours of game clock time. It has to do with whether the day-night cycle rolled over. Which is a little bit annoying and tedious. Oh wow, okay, so the skeleton knights just don't spawn until they we get the triggers in the other part of the room. So we're just getting like a reverse of this first room, huh? Again, this is not something I typically want. I do not want these things to be fought twice. The run's long enough. We did not get the Silver and Gold Knight. I bet the poisoned undead on the other side are probably alive. Critters respawn. That being said, bats generally will be in the tunnel anyway. Another set of bats will spawn at the bottom of those stairs. We're probably going to switch to Dwells in Light. Nope, we won't because our health is already too high to get any value out of it. Once we hit these stairs right here, bats will spawn. Yep. And let's see if the skeleton's in here. Yep. So basically, all of the standard enemies respawn because they're not that impressive. And then the Golden Silver Knights didn't respawn because those were the more or less premier enemy of this configuration. The other configuration would have had the ghosts respawn, uh, but the living armor would not have. The living armor would have stayed separate, which is fine.
another cool thing is the items respawn. So we've got that flask. No dragon. I don't see the gargoyles. I can hear one. I can see the other. So my assumption was correct. Gargoyles did respawn. No dragon though. I would have been astounded if a dragon respawned. And now if there's a cursed dragon in here, that's different. Vault of Defiled Truth. Uh, a couple different configurations we can have, obviously. What's nice is we are done with any backtracking, so we won't have that Midnight Helix issue. Or not the Midnight Helix, the Ward of Regret issue won't happen again. We don't backtrack anymore. But the Cockatrice configuration is the one we have. This room will have a Death Spawn, then, as the Carrion Beast. Uh, this room also has a three ranger pond party up at the top on the balconies. So we do want to deal with them. We do have the Bastion Augment, so they won't absolutely shred us with their physical damage from their arrows. But they're still very dangerous. We don't want to get hit by them. So we're going to deal with them first, because if we're in the courtyard area down below, they will just snipe us. There are two more. Two more ranger ponds, I mean. Uh, one is on the balcony to our right, which we have to jump across to reach. The other one looked like it just entered the middle balcony that we were standing on. I'm moving back to see if he hopefully moves. Sometimes they'll get closer if you come this way you can kill the second one a little bit easier. The third one, which is the one that's on like the balcony to our right, once we get all the way up to the top, that, that guy can't move. He doesn't go anywhere. He will always stay up there. He can either be on the railing or on the, the platform of the balcony. He's not going to really change between the two. This guy didn't get closer, but he's in this little alcove. Gives us a nice opportunity to hit him. We're actually in really good shape because we're full health. That guy jumped off of his his railing and so he's on the flat portion of the balcony, which is absolutely great for us because it makes it extremely safe to come up to him. That was one tenfold flurry that he did and we lost about half of our health. We went from, what is it, 48, 20? I think that's what our maximum health to about 40, or 2,600. That's, that's a huge drop. Also, my dogs are playing, so if you guys hear some little barks and stuff, it's because they're fighting each other. That's what they do. My wife and I live in constant fear. They are, they are actually just playing, but they, they play by playing Bitey Face, which is a horrifying game. They seem to love it, so... Uh, because... We are wearing the Immortal set. We actually have very decent resistances. Uh, and we were able to tank that yell that the cockatrice, yeah, the cockatrice did. Without really getting debilitated, we got silenced, but silence does actually nothing because we're not a spellcaster. But we have a lot of physical and magic defenses because of our armor, but more importantly, we have a lot more debilitation resistances than I'm used to on a run. Usually on our no-hit runs and all of the casual runs leading up to it, like while we're gearing up and stuff, I don't wear as good of armor as this. 
uh, I generally stick to some cosmetic armors instead. And uh, because of that, I'm not used to having the ability to tank things, but you'll see me tank a few things this run because I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't get that opportunity often. So I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of it. It becomes quite fun. Now that we've killed those, we're going to have goblin shamans up in the room ahead. Uh, three of them will be on the ground at the start. A fourth one will jump down. Well, I say on the ground, one of them's like on a block on the side, but you know, there's three accessible when we enter. The fourth one will jump down and we only need to worry about the, the last one. Yep, so one of them already jumped down. Now, this guy, we basically just need to evade his spell cast until he chooses to use Ingle. Once he chooses Ingle, we can climb the ladder. The reason we can climb the ladder is because his Ingle, he can't aim it down at us. So we basically get the entire duration of the spell cast for Ingle and then the next spell to make it up the ladder before he finishes that next spell because Ingle won't hit us, so he has to intone a brand new spell and finish the cast to actually hit us. And it just doesn't happen. Here we're going to have Eliminators. But yeah, so if you're doing a melee build, or even if you have the other configuration where the the Goblin Shaman will not be on the edge of that platform, so you can't really reach it. Um, if you have the other configuration, you can do the same strategy. Just look through the slats in the wood to uh, determine whether he's casting Ingle or not. And then once you notice it's Ingle, you just move on. Here we have two Eliminators, so we're going to try the Arc of Obliteration. If we land it, it deals alright damage, but it's nothing insane. And because we saw it was nothing insane, we do that. Now, if we didn't have a ceiling above us, that Arc of Obliteration probably would have killed or done a lot more damage to the Eliminator. The ceiling is the problem here, because Arc of Obliteration itself doesn't, like I said before in the Garden of Ignominy, Arc of Obliteration does decent damage, but it's not that great. However, on things like Eliminators, we will launch them into the air when we get our Arc of Obliteration up. So if we launch them high enough, when they fall, they'll take gravity damage and often die or take like multiple health bars worth of damage. Jumping light attacks knock these guys down very consistently. That's why you see us with them. Then jumping heavy while they're on the ground. Jumping light again so that we can get a headshot in. We want to build up as much stagger as we can. Because if they stick around over here, we can sometimes get another knockdown. We have so much oil. <laughs> but anyway, um, because Arc of Obliteration, one, launches them away from me and doesn't deal incredible damage, it's honestly just better to let them charge at me, knock them down, and hit them. Which is a sad truth, but it's, it, is, it is what we have. Again, there's just too many points where the arc of attacks just fail to fail to excite, I guess, is what I would say. As such a cool move as they are, and some of the most satisfying abilities to hit, they just they just aren't very effective tools for most situations. the head on all of those shots. 
You can you can see the visible difference between getting a headshot. That was a headshot. Most of these aren't though. But you can see the difference in how much damage we deal when we actually get headshots versus just hitting. Like the shoulders. Just a couple in a row. Now the only enemy that should remain is the hobgoblin over here by the boulder. Uh, we do have death as the potential carrying beast. Oh, there's the music. So, speak of the devil, right? Um, death is not too bad. I th think we have 100% sleep resistance. We'll see in a moment. Uh, but if you have 100% sleep resistance, you can just wail on these guys. Or on death. And he can't hit you. The only thing he has to do against you is attempt to side you, which is extremely telegraphed. So, we will see if I have 100% sleep resistance or not. Because if I do, I will be running into him and just wailing on him. <laughs> so if I had turned off my lantern, we actually probably could have snuck up on him. It looks like we have sleep resistance. But anyway, we could have snuck up on him and actually hit him in the back a little bit. Here's that side. You can generally just walk away from the side. It's not that dangerous. It only comes dangerous if there's like terrain features blocking you. Now being behind him like this is generally where I would prefer to be. We're kind of rotating to the side a bit, but I want to be behind him because sometimes he'll back up to swing his side at you and he'll just keep pushing you back and he won't hit he won't start his wind up yet. And it just gives you a bunch of free hits. So you otherwise wouldn't land. As you see, having the sleep resistance, we deal physical damage, so death is a little bit more susceptible to physical damage. I don't know if he's weaker to bludgeoning or slash, I would imagine it doesn't matter. But uh, the physical damage is the way to go, and we have good physical damage. Gutter of Misery. We do not have an undead right here, so we have the Saurian configuration. These are Sulfur Saurian, which are weak to fire. We do not have fire, so we will just slash at them with the bitter end. It should be, frankly, quite easy to kill. So we should sever the tails and swing and then deal incredible damage, frankly. Yeah, even on the big one, we took one sword swing to remove his tail, so... So what I was trying to do there was get the drop on him so that I could, uh, cut his tail before he was, like, in combat with me. Uh, because if he gets in combat with me, they'll kind of often move to avoid having their tails cut, and I was hoping to just make it a little bit faster by just hopping behind them. But he saw me, so that didn't work. Uh, because we had Saurians up top, we're going to have greater goblins down below, accompanied by Eliminators. There are two Eliminators, one on either, like, canal, I guess, in the gutter. We'll deal with them one at a time. But all of the goblins will kind of come at us in regardless of which way we are headed. Usually the goblins are a little bit faster at heading our way. So that's why I'm kind of just standing back here because usually I don't even have to like go down to this little cross space to have one attack me. But, you know, whatever. I'm a little bit surprised I'm using the lights here. This might have been muscle memory kicking in more so than decision making. 
That's my bad. Again, we do stream these live over at twitch.tv, so whenever you see me kind of paused over here, it's likely that I am, uh, it's likely that I am talking to chat. So, you guys should pop in and see these runs live, mostly the failures, uh, the, a lot of failures. At the moment, we are leveling up actually we just finished leveling up a mystic knight um we are intending to do a shield only mystic knight run which we have done on stream before but we don't have a video of we are going to attempt to do that without uh, using curatives and the only healing we're going to use is predation augment and it's going to be a challenge but it'll be fun Another slow run that one will be because for us to effectively deal damage we have to have enemies attacking us. We may elect not to go into the Ward of Regret on that run because we physically can't do anything against the ghosts in the Ward of Regret. Other ghosts that spawn during that run in any of the other rooms we can do stuff against because other enemies exist to use and leverage but when it's just ghosts we're kind of scum but we'll see as of four we're just gonna wail on this guy um, he resets a lot so, it gives us a lot of opportunities to just jump and wail on his back. But... When he's not reset, we're gonna do basically the strategy we use in the Bulk of the Fire Troop, which is let him charge at us, knock him down, jump him heavy while he's on the ground for the extra damage. Not the most exciting fight, but that's okay. Uh, this configuration has Elder Ogre that can spawn down here. So, I'm trying not to have move myself too much further down the tunnels to have it spawn. They don't really want it to spawn while I still have the Illuminator alive. However, the Illuminator is hardly dangerous in comparison to the next time we're in a sewer where an elder ogre can spawn which is if we get the living armor configuration of the bloodless stockades that one also has an elder ogre that can potentially spawn and that's obviously a bit scarier than eliminators plus elder ogre so we uh we're okay if it spawns here and in fact, the Elder Ogres, with their own Devil's Nail, will actually hit the uh, Elder Ogre. Fairly consistently, I might add. Eliminators are very, they're, they're, they're quite resistant, frankly. Um, realistically, we could be using the Twin Thing right now, and it wouldn't be a bad decision. I think later in the run, we actually elect to use the Twin Thing on these guys. 
because it will get freezes off. But ultimately, like, the damage is, like, kind of comparable. Uh, it's not impressive in comparison. It's, it's about the same. But that's okay. Let's see if we get the Elder Ogre spawn. It can often happen right here. Nope. Okay, we're good. That's it for the guard, uh, for the Garden of Ignominy. No, that was ages ago. That's it for the Gutter of Misery. We're full health and stamina leaving it, so on to Gazer. Uh, Gazer, we can shear off tentacles and all that jazz. I don't remember what strategy we use, frankly. Oftentimes what I'll probably do is wait until he does a lightning attack and then I'll jump on the face. Here's the lightning attack. So here's the jump on the face. Yep. <laughs> That's what I thought. So you can you can just cut tentacles when he attacks you, or when he spawns them around you, and then when you cut the tentacles, you can... Uh, once, once you cut enough, he will spawn the big one that you can lure to hit him in the eye. It's an effective strategy, deals good damage, but it's honestly, it's just slower. And we don't care about getting hit. This isn't a no-hit run, so we might as well just climb up here, allow ourselves to tank a hit or two, deal faster damage, and move along with this run. And even taking that damage, we just regen all of our health with the Immortal set uh, from the hits we took, which weren't incredible. Obviously, they weren't that serious of hits. But it's just, this is just a faster strategy. It's very consistent. We don't have to wait for, uh, we don't have to wait for tentacles to spawn. We don't have any iframes, so if we have multiple tentacles spawn, we don't really have a good method to evade them if they cast at us. Other than running around like a madman. So, this is actually a little bit safer. And as I said, it is quite, quite quick. Nice, easy gazer fight. And we're an hour and seven minutes in, it looks. And uh, we have completed the first third of this run. So if that's any indication to you guys of how long this run is, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty long. It's a bit rough. But that's okay. We'll be moving on the Fortress of Remembrance. Okay, getting started with the Fortress of Remembrance. I did not. Did we have the Strigoi? Oh, we did. Okay. I must have blinked when we moved that way. Alright, so we have the Strigoi. If we don't move too far forward, the ghosts don't notice us and we can kill this Strigoi solo. Which is what I would prefer to do. So, the hammer, the bludgeon, double scan. Now we're going to switch back to the Dwells in Light for the holy damage. Wraiths are weak to holy, specifically. Not magic, holy. They are just vulnerable to magic damage. If we stay up here, we will not have the other two Strigoi that remain aggro us. We can hit these guys for free. Well, I say free. It's not like they're not going to try and do stuff. But we can hit these. It's pretty easy to... Uh, I guess, shatter them. So it actually makes it not too bad. We got grabbed. I don't really care. Um, often, when I do these solo runs, if I'm not trying to have a no-hit run, obviously, I will wear one of these as a hat because it prevents me from getting hit by the other ones. It allows me to really just strike them. 
On this run specifically, I am even more inclined to do so because we have a full set of immortal gear. If you look at our health right now, it ticks down to like 119 and then it immediately goes back up to 120 because the ghost just physically can't deal enough damage to me in order to have me lose actual health. Now as I'm wearing it as a hat, we scroll down, we move down a little bit, and then we can hit this boy. That's gonna be a grab. Well, I guess that means we get a chance to blood red gem. Blood red crystal rep. That ghost just drifted off the ground or over the side. So it has to dash in order to get back up. We'll see if it does. I heard a dash, but that doesn't necessarily mean it made it up. Oh, there it did. That was pretty good timing, considering. Okay, and we should put the hammer back on for the final Strigoi. This area right here is not, not too bad, obviously. We jump because it's really the only way to hit him. <laughs> oh. And because we had ghosts, uh, we should have corrupted pawns up here. If I remember properly. Oftentimes I will use the explosive barrels on our right to be my first strike on the corrupted pawns, but uh, I don't recall if we do that. I also don't recall if we choose to charge up a arc of. It doesn't look like it. We just wail on them. That's it for part one. Entering the Pilgrim's Gauntlet, we can see that Saurian ahead of us. That means we have the nicer configuration. Uh, this configuration has no Hellhounds, which makes it nice up here. And then down below, it doesn't have Ghosts and Fire Drake. Instead, it'll have two uh, Golems, as well as four sirens so this is by far a much kinder configuration especially for us because we don't have particularly good magic damage it just saves a lot of time uh, instead of hellhounds we get banshees as you can see that one to our left right now i don't know why i accidentally dropped that i will set that down If I recall correctly, Banshee's going to do bludgeoning damage. Which is why we got the hammer out. But Saurian prefer the slash damage. Especially if you're going for a tail cut. Now we could use the Twinterfang on these guys, and it would be actually quite good because of the ice damage. However, it's not very necessary because our physical damage is so great with the bitter end. It just isn't necessary. Huh? We do switch to the Twinterfang. So that's cool, we get to showcase both. I like the Twinterfang, it looks cool. What's interesting is that if you look, it only has two beaks on the... Uh, it has two beaks on the uh, actual weapon there, but if you look at the icon in the in-game <laughs> menu, it has three. I always found that interesting. 
And you saw there with the ice damage, we do really good damage to the Saurian, especially if we break the tails. Twin Fang, like I said, it's a good choice here. Uh, we're going to have some spiders in this hallway. Never a problem. Spiders are incredibly uh, vulnerable to elemental effects. So if I had brought a bolt bringer, which is the weapon level 2 longsword that has an element on it, it has lightning. If I had a bolt bringer, we would deal, uh, we would have the static shock hit almost all of the spiders in one go. I think we only have to hit like two to kill all of them if we hit the right two. So it's uh, not a bad choice. Unfortunately, it's very heavy to have like excess weapons like a, as a warrior because our weapons are so large and heavy. Furthermore, if I was low health, I could have hit all of them with the Dwells in Light. And it would have been, gotten me, it was like 16, 17 health each time because it's 10% of our base defense as we calculated earlier. I'm thinking that's what the number was. I don't really remember uh, how much base de magic defense specifically we had, but we were pretty full health. So you can only recover your white recoverable health when you do that, so. Should be one more. There it is. If you swing wide and you don't go too far down that way, you can aggro all of these before before you have either of the golems spawn. If you walk and just climb, not jump, but just climb, you can sometimes get the first one like this standing before the second one does anything. Which is what we did. So there, it's a little bit awkward. We accidentally, uh... Froze both of them now. But we didn't mean to freeze this guy. Fortunately, he'll be really easy to knock down because we still have the back. That's why we hit everything else. He still has his foot, which is why we're not hitting the back yet. We're going to want to knock him down. I thought we broke his hand. Apparently we did not. But that's okay. I like the little bit sketch. There we go. One down. Now if we hit him in the chest, he might fall over. If we hit him in the face while he's doing his laser, he usually will as well. That was very generous, him bending over so much to let us hit him in the head. <laughs> we'll take that. But that's it for the Pilgrim's Gauntlet. That was a pretty clean Pilgrim's Gauntlet. I think the most damage we took was uh, from catching fire from one of the Pyre Saurian. So, not bad ultimately.
back into the Fortress of Remembrance. We're gonna have one, two, not one, sorry, two liches. One lich is on the uh, ghost, or sorry, the we have the ghost configuration, that's right. One lich is on the uh, undead configuration. Both configurations actually have two liches. The difference is this one has two up here, and the other one has one up here and then one down below. So Ark of, we don't really need the hammer out for this, but it doesn't actually matter either. This is for the Eliminator when it charges at us. Hopefully we don't get by two ancient mannequins. And as you saw, once again, Arkov is a disappointing attack. <laughs> we just don't get that much damage out of it. I don't know if we have the Obliteration Ring, or if that was just the Arca Deliverance, but... Still, not ultimately very impressive. We got hit by that Pustule, so we have the Strength and Defense. And magic defense down, and regular magic down, debilitation. What that means is we're going to take less damage and we're going to. Or sorry, we're going to take more damage and we're going to deal less damage. Not exactly what we want, but it's okay. So, what I'm doing here, uh, I don't know if this is me just being silly and superstitious or what, but I find that I get more opportunities to attack these guys if I sheathe my weapon and walk away from them, because they'll often lower. But we'll see. That's why you see me sheathe and kind of walk away. Uh, I will also occasionally start heading down the stairs to our right. I didn't even see the indicator for that one, I just walked straight into it. This is the lowest health we've had in a good while. Okay, that guy's casting at the moment, so he's not going to move for a little bit. Unfortunately, he cast Ingle instead of Comestion or... Bolide. If it was Commission, we probably could have killed him. If you get one of them over the wall or over the side like that, it can sometimes work for our advantage like that. However, it'll often also be in a place where you can't reach them. So, I don't know if I would say it's worth trying to bait them over the side like that, but it is a gamble, and sometimes you can win. In this case, we managed to, but again, it is a gamble. We no longer have our debilitations, so we are going to be walking and dealing the correct amounts of damage now. I think that might have been the first time we've entered the low health phase where the, we get the red health. Obviously, we've already climbed out of it. But. I don't know. And this is where I lament the fact that we do not have Exodus Slash. Exodus Slash is iframes, we could have easily dodged that with Exodus Slash, it's not even difficult. We got hit by another Pustule, which means we have all of those previous debilitations again. So we are taking increased damage, dealing slightly less. 
This guy is one little hit away from death. So if we didn't get hit by that punch, we probably would have died there. But that's okay. He came back down. Uh, in not unreasonable amount of time. Next up are going to be some wraiths, so we'll be switching to the Dwells in Light here momentarily. We'll hop through this window to our left. That's one, there we go. Dwells in Light, as I said. And we just want to sidestep as they dash, and then just kind of beat them up. If they dash this far, they often will just try and leave. Wow. So it gives us opportunities to do what we need. That being said, I should never try and really fight them this far on the bridge. It's not a no-hit run, so I don't really care that much. But there's a difference between taking hits and taking needless hits. Um, we don't even gain, like, benefit for taking that hit. Like sometimes I'll allow myself to get hit so I can get like a bigger hit off or a, a more critical one if it's like a knockdown or something like that. But in this case we just kind of let ourselves get hit for nothing. We could have just stayed back here and been fine. At this stage we have 300, 400 health, right? And that's with the crazy health regen we have. So, it's just not, it's not something that was necessary for us to take that hit, I mean. So we, did, we didn't need to move up. We should have stayed back on the side platform over here because when you're on the side platform over here, it's unusual for them to grab you. If they do, they hop off like that and then they don't dash into you so much. They might dash closer to you, but they don't often dash and hit you. Which is what caused us to lose all of that health in the first place. Now we have one more. Now that there's only one, it doesn't matter if we're on the bridge portion here. Because there's no way for it to dash through us so long as we're quick about hitting it. And usually it's not a challenge to do. Usually we can just hit it. Like that. But when we had like two or three dashing through the others was not not really the play. So going down there's usually like corrupted pawns right here and another wraith but they just don't spawn a lot of the time. In between these two haystacks, if you walk perfectly between them, there's leaf worms in them, but they won't jump out at you. They won't spawn. Uh, but there's going to be a couple wraiths in the far back, some giant undead, which you just see spawned in, and then obviously the two eliminators that we see. Chillin'. So if you maintain being behind these guys, a lot of times you can prevent them from taking any action. So there we were. We were rotating around him as he was rotating. And it was preventing him from getting an attack off because we just kept kept keeping him spinning. And our audio's back because we got in the green again. Um, for those who don't know, that red health and the loss sound effect and whatnot, that is the delineation between when you are considered low health or not. So if you have exhilaration or equanimity or sanctuary, all of those are triggered when at low health, providing either strength, magic, magic or defense. Uh, that is the marker for you. You get to low health, when your health is red, and you have the audio, goofiness, that's when you get the extra 
extra stats per your augment. Now, since these guys are absolutely neck and neck with each other, we can bait them into charging together. Uh, which is why I didn't mind making that amount of distance. Now they're desynced, so it's a little bit more awkward if they charge uh, at the same time. Because what's going to happen if they charge at the same time is they'll reach us at different points because they're coming from different angles and distances. Fortunately, that second one decided it wasn't ready to charge me. So we were given the opportunity to kill one. But if they had both charged at the same time, it would have been a little bit awkward. Not necessarily troubling, but it would have been awkward because what happens more often than not is I can jump in, knock one down, and then the second one like hits me as I'm recovering out of the first hit. And that's when you run into trouble. There are two ghosts. I don't know where the other one is. I don't know why the other one's not here at the moment. But I'm okay with it. We'll just wail on this one. And we went from 300 health earlier to obviously much more health, just in the time that we've taken to kill these eliminators and the ghosts last time. There we got a couple little healing bits back. Each time it's only like 16, 17 health, so it's not... It's not really helping. <laughs> like it's... It's only relatively faster than the actual healing tick that I get from my armor set, but, you know, every little bit helps, I guess. That's the last ghost, so all we have is this giant undead. And we're at 3,000 health now. Which is, uh, you know, 10 times the amount of health we had when we were fighting the ghosts on the platform above us, so we're pretty happy about that. So, moving on to the Tower of Treasons Repaid. This can have two different configurations. We got the one I don't want. The reason I don't want this one is because, one, the caster's annoying. Two, a cursed dragon can spawn in it often will before we reach the ground floor. But three, I can't actually reach one of the enemies in this room. That guy there that's casting that frazzle. I can't hit him. I can't hit him because I can't make it into that cave as a warrior. I need to have some sort of ranged damage to deal some, to deal with that guy. Now, that doesn't mean I can't have him die. Um, you can occasionally get him to walk out of his cage and he'll fall and take a lethal fall damage. If he does, every time they cast a spell, they take like this tiny, tiny step forward. So if they are stepping forward at the right angle, they can fall out of the cage. But ultimately, if I keep moving down through this uh, area, it is unusual or uncommon at the very least that uh, he continues to cast at me. She just fell. The Banshees won't tank lethal fall damage uh, if they just fall of their own accord. If you throw them, they will. But 
Not from this ledge, though. It has to be from the higher one. But he's still casting at us, which is a touch unfortunate. Because, like I said, usually he'll stop casting if we're all the way at the bottom. We did not get the Cursed Dragon to spawn, at least not yet, which is nice. Usually it'll spawn right before we deal with that last uh, walkway. So we actually have a little bit of opportunity here to kill all of the Banshees. Um, the Banshees I find most troubling against the Cursed Dragon uh, because the Banshees are... Damn it. The Banshees will yell, and when the Banshees yell and you're in close enough proximity, what'll happen is you'll get knocked down, and you're, you're vulnerable still. So, I prefer to kill the Banshees as early as possible. I don't know how we didn't get knocked down there. I guess we have high enough stagger resistance? Question mark? I don't want to get hit by that breath. One's a lot of damage, too. I don't want to be poisoned. Assuming we can be poisoned. I don't actually know if we can. There's still a couple more skeletons, so we'll try and clear them out before we deal with the dragon. The dragon flying is actually not the worst thing, so he's not going to hit us except for his breath. So it actually gives us a good amount of time to deal with these skeletons. We just have to be mindful of the breath itself so that we can effectively dodge it. I think that's the last one, because I think the one that's over here spawned already. Yeah. So now, we can just deal with the dragon. Um, I believe I should switch to the bitter end here. We took that breath, which is unfortunate because we were literally sprinting and going at an angle, so like, the fact that he actually tracked us really good is annoying, but also mostly just surprising. But, oh well. So we'll see how we deal with uh, the dragon this time. Uh, we can choose, as I mentioned last time we fought one, we can choose to knock it over the first time and then use Arc of Obliterations. That will typically keep it knocked over. All of these pauses is because I'm replying to something in chat. <laughs> so I apologize. I must have said something that required a touch more thought than I can autopilot type this dragon and uh, reply with. <laughs> Especially when I only have 2400 health. The dragon is still dangerous. It does hit rather effectively. And we don't have Exodus Slash to engage with. That's really the crux of the issue. We don't have Exodus Slash, so if we want to do something risky, we have to take a hit for the most part. We don't get the opportunity to utilize items. Okay, that's a stagger. We want the knockdown. And there it is. And it looks like I don't choose to use the uh, Arc of Obliteration tactic. The Arc of Obliteration tactic is kind of cool because it keeps him chain knocked down. It's not faster damage necessarily. It's relatively comparable, but it blows through all of your stamina very quickly without having done that much damage to him. This is the thing, whereas here I still have all of my stamina. We might elect to use it in the later parts of the fight. Sometimes I'll use it in the later parts of the fight because once we knock him down next time, 
will probably have his health low enough that he'll wish to do the big breath attack when he stands up. And uh, when that happens, if I'm using the Arc of Obliteration tactic, we might knock him down a few times before he does his breath, so he'll be even lower health before he chooses to do it. But it's not necessarily that much better. Again, it doesn't... Arc of Obliteration doesn't do really like crazy good damage. For what it, for how big the channel thought time is and all that jazz. It's just such a... You're so vulnerable for, I don't think, as much gain as it deserves. Um, again, though, a supremely satisfying ability to use just because of the knockdown. It, it's one of the few abilities in the game that is a physical attack that just feels ridiculously powerful. As it should. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like I'm hating on Warrior or Arc of Obliteration, by the way. I actually thoroughly enjoy Warrior. It is not a vocation I want to play all the time, mind you, but it's one of those, like, guilty pleasure vocations that I want to play occasionally. Okay, we got the knockdown again. And when it, every once in a while, I'll be like, I really want to do a Warrior run. Make a Warrior. Warrior does, it is a lot of fun knocking things over and then beating it up. But. It does come with its uh, limitations and its frustrations. In this case, we've, you know, handicapped ourselves by. Not having Exodus Slash. But it's okay. Pummel Bash is another ability that I almost always will run. Uh, and that is for Elder Ogres. So those two are basically the abilities that I consider mandatory uh, on my solo fighter runs, generally. Uh, and we have neither, so it's. This is a very different fighter, or sorry, fighter, warrior. It's a very different warrior run that I'm used to having, or used to doing, so. It's interesting. Not having access to those two abilities is indeed noticeable, at least to me. Forsaken Cathedral. I don't know if I heard a Saurian or if I heard a Goblin. It sounded like a Goblin. Nope. Sorry. Okay, this configuration is a little bit annoying because we have ghosts at the very end of the hall. Um, but we have the Twinterfang, which is quite good. So before, we didn't need to use the Twinterfang because we had those jugs of water. So the ice wasn't, like, crazy critical we could just get rid of their fire anyway but having the ice damage here is going to help us bust that dude's ass and uh, lose his tail I don't know why I got rid of the Twinkie thing, but that's okay. I mean, the, the weapons are comparable, right? Bitter End has more strength and therefore good damage, uh, but also um, is Slash, which is what the Saurians are more susceptible to. Twinter Fang is bludgeoning damage, so they're a little bit resistant to that. Uh, and it has split stats on it, which is not always ideal, uh, but it is ice, which is what they are also vulnerable to, so it's kind of, it's really a pick-your-poison type situation, but 
I don't know. For whatever reason, I wanted the bitter end the second time. Maybe it's because I wanted to not have to switch between Bitter End and Twinter Fang to kill the Goblin Shaman and then the uh, Higher Sorry. But we'll see. Crimson Stone. Sounds a good job. Um, you often need a bunch of those whenever you have a weapon that requires the material. It's uh, often the case that you need like six Crimson Stone for, <laughs> to rarefy something when you need Crimson Stone. So I will often pick up Crimson Stone if I see it. But not this time, obviously. We already have our entire loadout determined for the run, so we don't have to worry about Not a whole lot of damage to that. Huh? I wasn't sure. Figured I'd test. Oh well. And this will just be a continuation of our previous fights against the Eliminators, right? Nothing nothing new here, nothing groundbreaking. We're not reinventing anything. As before, the easiest way to deal with them is to let them charge at us, knock them over, and then beat them up. We have these two Pyrosaurian, which are definitely annoying. But after that, we're going to have a handful of Wraiths, as well as giant Geosaurian. Wraiths, again, as always, we're going to use the light. The giant Geosaurian um, are also weak to ice. So we'll see if I choose the Twinter Fang or if I choose to go back to Bitter End. Um, both would be fine. I would actually probably say that Twinterfang's a better option against them because they do have more resistances and they can freeze and whatnot. They have, they have more health than the Pyrosaurian do. But we'll see what I do. Uh, initially we're going to deal with these ghosts though. There's like four or five ghosts so we don't want to sleep on them. Also if we stay just at this top platform um, it gives us benefits in two ways. One for the most part, the ghosts won't dash through us. Um, to the giant Geosaurian will stay down there. They're not gonna often come up to us. We got a little close there, so they'll start yelling, but they'll often, again, stay down there. Anyway, they're not gonna start climbing up. Uh, a third benefit of being up here is that if we do have a... Okay, one of them's starting to walk this way, but his buddies are body blocking him. Anyway, if we do have one of these uh, wraiths become our new hat, uh, they will often pop off of our head after a, a little bit if we're up here, because this is not where they want to be on top of your head for whatever reason. It'll make them reset a little bit, which is also why they stop trying to grab after a couple seconds, whereas usually you can, if you're in an area that they're keen on, they'll just like keep reaching for you. Um, but here it gives us the opportunity to hit them without them really doing a whole lot to us. Uh, in the event that things get out of hand, we can also walk out the door to our right when that happens. The enemies that spawn in this room specifically will reset. All of their positions will reset. So if we have like a ghost on our head, the ghost will disappear off of our head and reset in the room somewhere. And then if we have the giant Geosarian come up here as well, they'll reset their positions. 
Um, so if things get particularly hairy, we can always reset the loot in that regard. And it won't make things respawn or anything like that. Everything that we kill will remain dead. But it'll just reset the positions of things that are alive. I used to think it reset their health too, but now I'm not so certain. It looks like it doesn't, actually. And here's the answer to our question. We appear to go Twin Fang. I think Twin Fang's probably the better bet. Um, it's going to be hard to hit these guys' tails. Obviously, I say that and we hit a tail immediately, but there's three of them, right? So it's going to be tricky to hit all of their tails. And the Twin Fang's ice damage is going to be really nice. We actually had no trouble hitting all of their tails, so mark me down as a liar. <laughs> that was a pretty sweet, smooth uh, fight against them, though. Um, next, we're going to have the Dark Bishop fight, though, so no more Twinter Fang. Back to Bitter End. So Dark Bishop, uh, obviously, killed the Cursed Dragon first, then we switched to the Hammer to hit the Bishop. If I recall correctly, this is a fight where we actually get to use the Lash ability. Two great effects. There we go. And he just dropped that pustule, which is actually kind of good for us. We should be switching to the hammer. There we go. <laughs> I was about to say, the fact that we didn't switch to the hammer is a little bit troll. So if that pustule wasn't there, we could have actually knocked him down using two lashes. So long as they both actually hit the bishop, two lashes will knock it to the ground, which obviously means that we can deal damage. But we do want the barbed nails equipped uh, because the barbed nails increase staggering knockdown. I don't know. I didn't test it with one of with the uh, Savage Lash Ring equipped. I just didn't. So it might actually work to allow us to get the knockdown as well. The thing about it though is the Savage Lash takes slightly longer to cast and we don't have that much time. And then two, uh, we're getting rid of Stagger Knockdown Ring. Generally, that's kind of irrelevant though because the additional charge of the of like the ability makes it a more powerful ability. So usually, sacrificing the Stagger, we're going to pick up that Stagger anyway by the merits of the fact that we are just dealing a more powerful ability. But I know that two Savage Lashes does the deed, so we're gonna do that. Here we charge an Arc of Obliteration, and we just want to get right under its neck, and then wait, and then swing forward. We want to swing forward through his body. We should have been slightly further back on him. That way we could swing through his, like, uh, his chest cavity, basically, or through his chest into his neck. Uh, it just gives us the opportunity to hit more contact points with him. And if we do that, we'll... You can one-shot him as he spawns. Uh, I have done it before. Obviously, we didn't do it this time. But that's what we were going for. We just kind of missed our placement. We might have been, like, a second late as well. Which, which does matter. At any rate, exceptionally easy fight. The Dark Bishop is kind of a cool one for Warrior, in my opinion. You get to use... We both used a Blit Arc of, as well as Lash. You know, it's pretty cool. Here we switch to Dwells in Light because the next room can have ghosts, first of all, but we actually are probably going to kill these spiders for our 16, 17 health regen each time. Just going to speed up our health recovery. 
Spiders always give you uh, a proc of the elemental effect, so if it's lightning, it'll always chain. If it was ice, it would freeze them, but they die in one hit, so you'll never see that. Same thing with fire catching fire. Fire, or dark causing crits. Holy giving us health back. Leaf worms are similar. They will always proc the elemental effect, which makes it exceptionally useful for holy, but also ice because they'll freeze, and when you break them while they're frozen, they won't leave puddles. But with that, we're going to end the first video here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to drop a like. I do stream these runs live over at twitch.tv slash local Come check us out. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.